Hey guys, the weird kid here. So this is going to be something completely different from what I normally do. It's not a tutorial. Uh, it's not an interview. Um, this is, it's actually quite hard for me to talk about this because I've never talked about this with anybody uh, apart from um, immediate family. Um, my mom, my dad, uh, my few of my brothers, my wife, um, I haven't even told friends, never told anybody. And the reason why I didn't tell nobody for obvious reason is fear of ridicule, um, fear of um, being laughed at. But you know what? Um, what happened to me, I know could happen to another child. And, and so if this can help them, because what happened to me actually tortured and scarred me for many, 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 many. So, rather than keep on with the preamble, I'll just tell you what happened. So, I was born in 1969. I was born in uh, a hospital in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Uh, it happened to have been the same exact hospital that Gigi Allen was born in. I don't know if you guys know who he is, um, which really doesn't mean too much of anything. It's just that it's surprising because... Lancaster is such a tiny little town that like when you drive through it you literally blink and you're you're done you're gone through it and everything so but um after I was born I was we lived in a, a little town called Gorham New Hampshire which was about 20 minutes from the foot of Mount Washington and uh I remember being a happy child I was very happy um had a lot of fun didn't suffer any kind of abuse whatsoever in our family. Uh, my parents worked really hard and they loved us and took care of us the best they could. And um, yeah, no, no, no trauma. Um, but we moved to this house in Gorham. Um, backing up just a little bit, just to let you know, for whatever reason, uh, we found I found that we had moved quite a bit we would move somewhere and we would live there for a period of time and then we would move someplace else and then we'd move again I'm not even quite sure why um, I never did ask my parents why that was I know that uh, we were we fell on hard times uh, we were really poor my parents had to struggle just to find food to feed us um, they did a good job, though, and, and that doesn't define me and everything. They did a good job, so there was no problems there. Um, but we moved to this one particular house in Gorham. Um, I'm not going to mention where this house is, the address or anything, because the house is still there, and I don't know if it's being rented or if there's a new homeowner or whatever the case may be. But um, when we moved into this house... Our landlords, uh, who owned the house, lived right next door to us, and um, really nice people, from what I remember. And it was a big house; it was a big two-story house, old house. Um, I think it was built in, the, you know, like the 20s or 30s. And um, when you you drove up into the driveway, which was a dirt driveway. Um, we used to enter and exit through the side door, which came into like a little, I guess they call it a mud room. And then the kitchen was off from there. But right there, as soon as you open that door, there was this staircase, a super steep, super, I mean, super steep. You had to almost caught, you know, on your hands and knees, but it was a staircase. It wasn't a ladder. It was an actual staircase that was super steep. It went straight up to a hatch that you had to push up and throw over to go into this attic space. And we were told under no circumstances are we to go in that room. And we never did. I never did. 
I remember as a kid, very young, standing there looking up at it and asking my mom, what's up there, you know, a bit curious, but she, um, she said, I don't know, but we're not allowed to go up there, and so we respected, you know, the landlord didn't want us up there, we respected, but, um, living in that house, um, for whatever reason, my happy childhood ending, um, things started happening to me. Um, first of all, I started to suffer what I later learned was called night terrors, to where I would wake up just screaming and absolutely terrified, and that happened a lot, where I ended up having to sleep with my parents, because I was scared. Um, I shared a room with my brother, um, and then I, at the same time, my uh, next oldest brother, um, who um, we share the same mother, but we have a different father, um, lived with us. And um, I remember just, I felt uncomfortable in that house. I always felt uncomfortable in that house. And then this other things started to happen to me that was really, really bizarre. Um, and this is where you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but I did find out that it is an actual condition. I would be in my bed, or it could happen to me at day or night. It could happen to me at any point in time during the course of the day. But it, it happened more when, we, when I was home in that house. Um, and it only happened when I was in that house. Um, it was... Um, I would be sitting there and then all of a sudden everything, the whole room, furniture, all the objects in the furniture, in the room, on the furniture, the beds, the bureaus, chairs, it doesn't matter what room I was in, whatever the case may be, whatever was in that room would shrink. And it was like everything was in miniature. Sounds weird, doesn't it? And um, it used to terrify me. And I remember when it would happen, I'd feel it coming on because I'd feel weird. And then all of a sudden, within the blink of an eye, everything was tiny. And it was like I was a giant and everything was tiny. And I would rub my eyes and look and it would still be there. It, it messed me up. And um, I had it. It would calm. And then I wouldn't have it for a while. And then it would calm. And um, then I remember there was one particular night. I don't know. It had to have been like really late. Maybe 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't know. I didn't look at the clock. You know, I was like 6 years old. Uh, it happened. And I was terrified. And I went in and I was crying to my mom and dad and I, and I got in the bed with them and everything and I was laying in their bed and I was fine for a bit and then all of a sudden everything shrank down and uh, you know, uh, like in miniatures, everything was like dollhouse size. And it freaked me out. And so my mom had had enough and back then during that time, uh, you could call your family physician, especially in tiny towns like what I grew up in. And um, so my mom called the doctor, it was a family doctor, we, we knew him well, he knew us very well. And she called him and it had to have been like in the middle of the night. And uh, I remember her talking on the phone with him and I'm standing there and um, she hands the phone to me. She said, here, doctor, such and such. I, I mean, he's been long passed away, but I want to respect uh, his name. Um, doctor such and such wants to talk to you, and she handed me the phone, and I remember talking to him, and he's asking me, um, what, what is it that's happening? And I tried to explain to him, and back then I used to say, everything is, everything is small. Everything gets small. And we talked and everything, and then he said, okay, give me the phone back to your mom. And I gave it back to her, and they talked, blah, 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 blah. And then they hung up, and I was like, well, what, what? And she's like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. You know, I was young. She wasn't going to tell me. She was concerned. 
But I, what he had told her basically was to take, you need to take your son to a child psychologist. So the next thing you know, I'm getting carted off to a child psychologist. And I remember they put me in this room with all these toys and it was a big ball I could roll on it and play with all this stuff, not knowing that they're actually watching me play and seeing what my, you know, how I was acting and interacting with toys and stuff like that. And then they brought me in and I remember this doctor, he was a older gentleman, he had big white fluffy beard, kind of looked like Santa Claus was bald on the top, really super friendly really nice and uh, sat me down and gave me uh, paper and uh, magic markers or crayons and asked me to drop pictures and we talked and um, when it was done um, the basically they told my parents there's absolutely nothing wrong with him he's normal okay so you would think that would be the end of it I don't really know I, you know, I kind of wished, unfortunately my mom's passed, my father's passed, and I don't know if my brother that's just, you know, he's only like five years older than me would even remember being told what the reasons were, but um, it just kind of was dropped. Um, it wasn't until, um, it kept happening, you know, I kept having all these episodes and stuff like that, and uh, I was a tortured child, even at like six years old, I remember I was in a severe depression. Um, anyways, later on as an adult, I found out that there is a syndrome that's called, uh, forgive me if I say it incorrectly, Lilliputian syndrome, and um, yeah, or Alice in Wonderland syndrome. And um, I swear to God, it's a real thing. Uh, look it up. It's a real thing. And it had to do something with, like, chemical imbalance. But I know. And I know for a fact that there was nothing wrong with me mentally. There was something about that house. Okay? Um, I kept having these night terrors where I would see this person that I only know as the blue man and I can remember when I woke up in terror and my mom was there and she's like what is it and I would say the blue man the blue man now I don't know who the blue man was um, anyways um, the kicker was when we were having I had my grandparents over and some cousins and everything and I actually still got the picture there it is of when we're all sitting down having dinner and this is when I had my biggest episode um, we were in the kitchen eating and everything and I think we were just about done eating and I got up and I was walking towards the living room and then all of a sudden BAM the freaking everything shrunk and it became miniature and I, I just collapsed I was just I just had it it terrified me and I was just I was in hell I was in hell and I remember in my parents' living room, they used to have this big wooden crucifixion. It was a big one, and it had uh, a statue on it of uh, Jesus on the cross. My parents were super religious. We used to have church and everything. I was raised Roman Catholic. I went to catechism and First Communion and all that other stuff. Um, I remember running up to the cross and holding on to the cross, and I'm like, please, God, help me. Please, that's at six years old I'm doing this. And my dad was coming over to get me. He's like, come on, come on, come on. And I was like, something's wrong. Something's happening. And no sooner did I say that, but the phone rang. And my dad went and he answered the phone. And it was my uncle from Connecticut to uh, inform my father and mother that my aunt had just died, just died, um, coincidence, maybe, I don't know, coincidence, probably, coincidence, but, um, that's not where the kicker is, the real kicker is that I, I told you my, um, I've got another brother, we have the same father and mother, that's my, uh, my, uh, my next oldest brother, he's five years older than me. 
then I have two stepbrothers. Um, they were from a different father, but they are my brothers. They've always been my brothers, and I've never interacted them or treated any, any differently. Like, to me, they're my brothers. You know, we are brothers, blood brothers. Um, my oldest brother um, had received a piece of land next to uh, his father. His name was Roy, and he was always close to the family. Even my mom and my dad, my dad had no problem with him. He was close, we were all close. And we used to do things with him, you know, and my mom would still, they were friends. Even though they were divorced, they were still friends and civil. And in fact, my mom used to clean his house for him and all this other stuff because he was, he was an invalid, he had, um, he was real sick. He had a big house, a real big house, and um, next to it he had a piece of land that he gave to my oldest brother to put a mobile home, because uh, he had gotten married and started a family. My my uh, oldest niece was born and uh, was in that house, and they, my parents didn't want to take me to Connecticut, because they were going to stay there a lot longer than usual because they didn't want, uh, you know, they wanted to help my uncle with the transition. He, he really loved his wife, and uh, they wanted to help him get settled before they came back. And they didn't want to take me, besides I had school and everything else. So they asked my brother, my oldest brother, if I could, they could, you know, if I could stay with them. And he said, yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, Roy, his biological father that had the house next door, when Roy uh, lived in that house, he lived with a man named Jim. They were best friends, and Jim had owned the house. And when uh, Jim had developed, he had caught um, tuberculosis. And Roy had taken care of him up to the point he died. And when Jim died in his will, he gave the house to Roy. I used to call Roy my uncle. He was always my because I was good friends with him, and I always used to interact with him and stuff too. So, for I always called him my uncle. Um, he was family to me. Um, I spent a lot of time over there with him. Um, anyways, so um, Jim died, willed the house to Roy. Okay, and when. Uh, when my aunt died, and then my mom brought me over there to Kevin's house, that was my brother's oldest brother's name, was Kevin's house, to um, check and say, okay, is it okay? And she's like, yeah, and everything. So we went to Roy's house, the house on the corner, my two oldest brothers, biological father, and we went into the house, and I was following my mom up the wooden stairways to the second floor. It was another old house, really old house. And... Um, when we went into the house, the second floor, we walked in and my mom went through the living room, okay? And now keep in mind, I'm six years old. And in the living room, in the corner of the living room was a hospital bed. And in the hospital bed was this man that looked very sickly. And I knew that it was Jim. And in hindsight, years later, when my mom walked through the living room, she didn't even acknowledge him. She didn't say hello to him or anything, which I thought was weird. I didn't think it was weird at the time because I was six years old. But I stood there in front of him and I said, hi, Jim. And he looked at me and he said, hi. And... Um, I don't remember having any other words with him, but I remember just standing there, just observing and looking at him, and he was looking at me, and um, he was as real as real, you know, and so my mom talked to Roy, who was in his bedroom, and then she came out and said, okay, come on, let's go, and we left. And it was like a day or two later when my parents got organized, situated with their jobs, to take time off and go to Connecticut to spend time with my uncle. 
they brought me to my brother Kevin's house. And they dropped me off with my clothes and stuff like that. And uh, inside the front door was this little narrow wooden shelf. And on the shelf was a picture of Jim when he was alive, uh, naturally. Uh, and he had a black suit on and a white shirt and he had a camera. And I stood there and I looked and I said, I just saw him. And my brother said, even my, my sister-in-law at the time, they said, no, you didn't. And I said, yes, I just saw him upstairs in Roy's living room. And they said, no, it's impossible. He's been dead for five years. So I, I argued with them. I was like, no, because even to this day, I'm 50 years old now, to this day, I can describe to you what he looked like, and, and I know I saw him, okay? But they said he had died five years, you know, earlier, which means I was just a little tiny baby when he had died. Something else that didn't occur to me until many, many, many years later, uh, Tuberculosis is an extremely contagious disease. They say if you come in contact with it, you have to like have, I don't know if it's annual or a uh, test done every five years to make sure that you haven't contracted it. So I know my mom would not have put me at risk and put me around a man or anybody that had a contagious disease especially tuberculosis so you know and I never talked to my uh, there was my oldest brother was Kevin and then I have another brother on his, his name's Brad I never talked to him about this never talked to him about it <clears throat> um, anyways <clears throat> uh, to wrap up that portion of the story you know, um, we ended up, you know, it, it, things went on like that, and then, um, I saw a lot of things, there's stuff that I just refuse to talk about, I don't want to talk about it, um, I'm not ready to, maybe, um, but, um, when my parents, my parents, uh, my brother, my oldest brother, ended up moving out, and then my parents were able to buy that same lot next to Roy's house, the big house on the corner, and they put a mobile home there. And we moved there. I just turned eight years old. And once we moved there, all of the Lily put tea in the uh, syndrome or Alice in Wonderland syndrome stopped. Um, I stopped, you know, all the really bizarre stuff had stopped, you know. Um, something stayed with me for all of my life. Um, there's stuff that I experience and it happens to me that is still with me today, but I'm used to it. I just ignore it. I don't acknowledge it anymore. So anyways, um, what happened was uh, my brother, my brother Brad ended up uh, getting that house when Roy died, okay? And we never talked about this stuff, ever. He didn't know my story. I never told him that story. I didn't tell anybody that story. Um, he had got the house and when he was there by himself uh, trying to get it ready to sell he went in the attic and on, in the attic uh, on the um, the uh, Joyce's I guess we call them or the you know the, uh, the I know what they're called I'm just drawing a blank here the, the two by four frames in the attic there was a rocking chair that the legs were perfectly positioned on the two by four uh, trusses, trusses, and it was rocking back and forth. And he just got the hell out of it. He didn't want to know nothing. He didn't want anything to do with that. So he just left. He, he got out of there. Anyways, he sold the house to a young couple that had a child, a little girl. And Time goes on, and I think he said it was like, it wasn't until, uh, unfortunately, in my family, 
we only seem to get together when there's funerals and deaths. And um, unfortunately, in this case, it's when my father was sick and at the end of life. Uh, so my brothers came down and everything, and we hadn't seen each other for a long time. And uh, so we were sitting around a campfire, and we were talking and everything, and that's for the first time I told that story. And it scared the hell out of my brother Brad. Like, really scared him. And it really scared him because two years after selling that house, uh, he ran into the people that had bought it. And uh, he was just like, hey, how are you? And all this and that. And they said, great, and everything. And they, they started asking him questions about the house. And uh, my brother was like, why, what's going on? And they said that their daughter consistently insists that she keeps seeing a man in the living room. Um, and it just, he thought it was creepy at the time, but it really impacted him when all these years later, I mean decades later, I'm telling him this story of what happened to me in that house when I was six years old. So, long story short, uh, I guess the reason why I'm telling you this is because um, that was a it was a, it was traumatic experience for me. Okay, it was traumatic. It's not something I asked for. It, to me, it wasn't something fun. You know, I know now, ghost hunting and all this and that has kind of gone mainstream. Uh, I'm not into. I'm not like a ghost hunter. I'm not trying to start a paranormal ghost hunting show. Um, I just thought you might like to hear this, and I think maybe it would help me in a therapeutic way to get this off my chest. But more importantly, I think if you have a child that's experiencing something like this, please listen to them. Listen to them. Because this stuff is very real. Very, very real. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm 50 years old, and I can, I can tell you without a doubt that there is something going on we'll just leave it at that I don't really want to say much more than that but um, I have experiences all the time I'm used to it now I don't acknowledge it and I'm not here to uh, I'm not trying to get any kind of uh, recognition as the paranormal guru I'm not a guru I don't you know I just know what I know about my experience and um, I know the pain that um, I felt uh, the thing that blew me away was um, when I turned 18 I started dating this girl that already had a child um, actually she had two children and I was with her one time and um, I was at her house and she put the kids down for a nap and we were in the living room all of a sudden one of them had a night terror and we went running in and she's like he never he's never done this before and she's like what is it what is it what's wrong and he kept saying blue man the blue man and that blew me away because if you remember early on in my story when I had those night terrors who was giving it to me was called the blue man so who is the blue man that's a good question for you guys if I'm missing something, because I've done thorough research uh, on just that, you know, uh, to who the blue man is. And it's not the blue man group, so don't come up. Keith, uh, Keith or Vic from, uh, Vic from uh, Graveyard Creepers and uh, Keith from Cobwebs and Candlesticks. I know, I'm going to take that, that away from you, man, because I know right off the bat they're going to be like, oh, it's the blue man group, you know. No, it's... <laughs> It's not the Blue Man group. Uh, the Blue Man was terrifying. He was terrifying. Although I can't describe him. I don't know who he is. And then, like, all these years later, you know, from six years old up until I was 18 years old, and then all of a sudden I had this experience where this child's waking up screaming, like I did, and he's saying it's the Blue Man. So, I don't know. Coincidence again? 
I don't know. If you guys know who the blue man is, please comment down below. Um, anyways, I just wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, we're going to get back to our regular scheduled program. Consider this a little bonus, if you will. I don't know where it's going to take me. If I want to get some negative comments as a result of this or positive, I'm, I'm willing to take whatever comes. So, uh, I appreciate you guys, and uh, I'm actually, it actually feels good to get that out and tell, tell somebody other than, you know, just a select few people I have because it's, it's I've, I've carried that all my life. I've carried that all my life, and it has impacted me and held me back in a lot of regards so uh, I'm ready to put the past behind me and heal from it and uh, but just please if your child is you know if they're they're insisting on something like that just please just listen to them don't think they're crazy they're not crazy because there's definitely something going on here okay so uh, if you haven't done so already please like and subscribe and hit the bell it's gonna let you know when I upload another video and I appreciate you guys so much and until next time peace